Praise the Lord, everyone. Uh, today's Sunday school lesson is talking about mercy. Hallelujah. And we just want to give the Lord praise for the mercy that he has shown unto his shown unto us. Um, we want to give him praise for the, the grace that he's shown unto us. He's a God of great mercy, a God of grace, a God of true judgment, a God of right judgment. There's a, he's a righteous God. He's a righteous judge. Hallelujah. And we thank and praise the Lord for being his for being counted worthy, hallelujah, because with us, within us, we are nothing. We are absolutely nothing. So we thank and praise the Lord for the lesson on today, reminding us of his mercy, hallelujah. Our focus thought is we must not begrudge God for showing mercy on others because we need God's mercy, because we need God's mercy at all times. Our lesson text today is coming from Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And it reads, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before. Excuse me, therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore, now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then said the Lord, Dost thou does do, doest thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city and there made him a booth and sat under it in a shadow till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might shadow that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. But God prepared a worm in, when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd and withered it. And it came to pass, when the sun did arise, that God prepared a vehement east wind. And the sun beat upon the head of Jonah, that he fainted and wished in himself to die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the for which thou had not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up at night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh? that great city wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand and also much cattle. So that is our scripture text for today. And again, it's just talking about how Jonah didn't want the Lord to forgive Nineveh. But, some, but as we're going to come out in a lesson, we have to be careful because, you know, many times we do have people that, we say, um, Lord, get them. Lord, get them. They hurt me. Lord, you take care of them. You get them. And when we say, Lord, you take care of them, our mindset isn't usually, Lord, save them. Lord, help them. Lord, bless them. Lord, help them to forgive and all that kind of stuff. We don't, we, that's not what we're thinking. Usually when we say, Lord, get them, we mean, Lord, do something to them. Punish them. Punish them for hurting me. Why are you letting them get away with hurting me? Punish them. That's what we're saying. So we have to be careful because we want God to show us mercy because we don't always make the right decisions and we don't always treat people right. and We don't always do the right thing, but we don't want the punishment of God in our lives. So we want God to forgive us. We want God to have mercy on us. So we have to remember these things, you know, that that we got to do unto others as we would have God do unto us. And in other words, you know, we want God to forgive us and have mercy on us. So we have to show that same mercy to people because at any time God can choose, you know, 
if we don't show mercy to others, God can choose to just mess our lives up because he wants us to get to a point to where we are merciful. We, we pray, Lord, I want to have your heart. Lord, I want to make decisions. I want to know you better, Lord, and I want to make the decisions that you would want me to make. Well, sometimes that comes with pain. We have to go through some things because there are things in us that makes it hard for us to think like God, to feel like God. So, but the Lord wants us to think and to feel like him. So we're going to move on. It says, um, in the, we're going to read the culture connection. It says, giving and receiving mercy. It says, Lee picked up a group of men from a long-term care facility every week and brought them to church. One of the men, Greg, needed a wheelchair to get around and strongly depended on Lee to help him navigate the difficulties of an unfamiliar environment when he was still getting used to the wheelchair. One Sunday, Lee took Greg to church, helped him through worship service, and even made a way for him to share a nice meal with some of the church family afterward. After the meal, Lee was making a to-go plate when Greg asked, who is that for? Lee told him it was for George, another resident of the facility who had been suffering greatly that morning and had been unable to make the journey to church. Greg scowled and loudly proclaimed, um, well, I wouldn't do that. He doesn't deserve it. He, he hasn't been coming to church. Lee informed Greg that he would still take George a plate of food. Greg's demeanor immediately fell and he mumbled and grumbled and complained the rest of the afternoon. Greg had been having a wonderful time until he found out Lee was taking George a meal. Greg did not feel George deserved a plate since he had not come to church. He was okay with receiving mercy for himself, but was not willing to let others receive mercy. He allowed his lack of mercy to ruin his day and was still complaining when Lee took him home. His last words were, well, I bet if I wasn't coming to church, you wouldn't bring me a plate of food. How sad that we become, excuse me, how sad that we sometimes let our self-serving human nature blind us to the needs of others. Closeness with our Father realigns our perspective to love and serve like him. So here this guy is, he's, he's, he's in a wheelchair and he's having issues, having problems. So he, this, this guy, Lee, he's helping him every step of the way, helping him in the church, helping him, you know, if he, if he needs a wheelchair, you know, he has to help him to get him in the vehicle, then get the wheelchair, get him in the wheelchair, get him in the church. And then, then it said, hey, even after church, he made a way to get him to the dining hall or whatever so that he could eat. So after getting all of this help and all of this assistance, when he found out that Lee was making a plate for George, which couldn't come because he was having a hard time that morning and couldn't make it to church, Greg was upset because now Greg got a meal. Greg got to go to church. He got to get out of the home. And now he's grumbling because George is about to get a plate and he didn't come to church today. So... It's, 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 it's a hard pill to swallow, but we have to see that sometimes we act that way too. Like this one doesn't deserve it or that one doesn't deserve it or why are they getting that kind of attention? We really have to be careful how we, our perception of things, how we put ourselves first. You know, I deserve it because I'm here. They don't deserve it because they're not here. All right, moving on into the lesson, it says, Jonah's call. It says, many of the prophets expressed reluctance when God called them. Perhaps they felt they had good reason for attempting to escape the Lord's commands. Moses referenced his inability to speak, while Isaiah identified himself as a man of unclean lips, dwelling in the midst of a people with unclean lips. Jeremiah blamed his youth for his shortcomings. Although some of these excuses might have had merit, 
Jonah's refusal to preach to the Ninevites ranks as the worst of them all. Jonah did not want to preach to these Assyrians because he was worried God would show great mercy to his hated enemies. The Assyrians were known for their atrocities. In fact, their kings bragged about their brut brutality during, their, during war. They had not shown mercy to others. So Jonah reasonably wondered why the Lord would desire to show mercy to them. It says, Jonah literally ran away from his calling. He headed down to the docks and boarded a ship headed in a direction opposite of Nineveh. Perhaps his absurd thinking led him to believe he could hide from the Almighty because he went down into the inner parts of the ship. Jonah could run, but he could not hide. The Lord had commanded him to preach to the Ninevites, and he would not relent until Jonah accepted his prophetic mission. God's mercy would not be stopped by a disobedient prophet. That question there says, why do you think we fall into traps of disobedience? Why do you think we fall into traps of disobedience? Well, it says here, you know, as we're let's just used for Jonah, for instance, because that's who the lesson's talking about today. So Jonah ran into his trap of disobedience because he hate, he disliked the Assyrians, he the those the Ninevites. He 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 hated them. He did he had a strong dislike for them because of the way they treated the people of God, because of the way the people of God were um, abused by them. So he took it personal and he was like, well, look, you know, Lord, why are you going to save them? Or, or why are you going to forgive them? Why are you going to show mercy to them? So he fell into its trap of disobedience because he did, he thought they deserved judgment. He felt like they have done so wrong. They have made the wrong choices. They have treated God's people wrong. So they deserve judgment. It was in his mind. They, they deserve it. They deserve the life penalty. They deserve to be, to be, um, uh, uh, to be um, just taken over by the Lord, allowing the Lord to punish them. They allow, they, they, he, in his mind, they deserved judgment. Well, if we look at ourselves, We've done people wrong. As we look back over our lives, just think of some of the stuff that we have done, how we have ruined people's lives, you know, and many of us, you know, somebody would say that we did not at that time when we were in the midst of doing those things, they would have said we did not deserve the mercy of God. Somebody would have said they need to be punished. They need to go to jail. You know, we some of us have done some some things that are jail time appropriate. You know, could have got years and years in jail, but it was the mercy of God that delivered us. That should, God just came through, and He said, "You know what? You're not gonna go. I know your heart, and I'm gonna let I'm gonna loose you." You know, and we have to be careful not to fall in, as the lesson says, a trap of disobedience choosing to do what we want to do over what the Lord is telling us to do. We have to be careful, whether it be fear, whether we feel like these people, they're not going to listen to us. They're going to ignore us. Maybe it's maybe we feel like it'll go in one ear and come out the other and they're not going to receive it. Like, oh, they're not going to receive me, whatever. Whatever the situation is, we have to get it in our mind that whatever God tells us to do, we need to do it. We need to be obedient to God. We need to be faithful to God. God, he needs to be able to trust us. Can you imagine? Just think about it from God's perspective. All that he has done for us and he asks a, something of us and we run from it and say no. Look at how many times he has forgiven us. Look at how many times he has put his arms around us and consoled us when we were hurting. He has uh, healed us, healed our bodies, healed us spiritually. We're no longer walking in sin. We're no longer in the habit of sin 
no longer in the practice of sin. Look, he's given us this opportunity, great opportunity. Now we have the opportunity to make heaven. God has been so good to us. He's cleaned us up. He set us on the right path. He just continually, continually, when we are low, he lifts us up. When we need encouragement, he's right there. When we need him to come through for us, he's right there there. When we don't have any idea which way we're going to turn and we turn to the Lord and say, Lord, I need you. And then he shows up. The song says he's an on time God. Oh yes, he is. But if we look at ourselves from God's perspective, he's there when we need him. Are we available, willing and available? Are, are we there? When he's needing us, when he has a task for us, he says, okay, well, you asked me to do that and I did it. You asked me to bless you with this and I did it. You asked me to open that door and I did it. You asked me, you asked these things of me and I did it. You asked me to touch your body and I did it. You asked me to heal your pain and I did it. You asked me to forgive you of your sins and I did it. You asked to, to, to you asked me to dwell inside of you. You, you asked to receive the Holy Ghost. And I did it. But I asked you to go over there and pray for such and such. And you bucking up against me like, oh, why? Or I asked you to go over there and bless such and such with, you know, you know you have money in the bank or whatever, or you know you get ready to get a check. But I I asked of you to go give that person $20 or whatever. And we rationalize it in our mind, say maybe that wasn't God. They probably don't need no money. Look at their car or whatever. Look at their hair, look at their shoes, whatever it is. We rationalize things. When God is moving upon us to do things, we are God's hands. We are God's mouthpieces here on this earth. He is moving and ministering to people through us. He is reaching people through us. He is perfor performing miracles through us. But how many times have we shut ourselves down and said, no, I'm not doing that. No, I'm scared. No, I don't know if they're going to hear me. No, whatever it is, we become Jonah. We become Jonah. So we have to be careful with our disobedience. We got to learn to be obedient to God and to do what he asks of us. The next section says a great storm. It says maybe Jonah thought he had escaped the Lord as he slept on the ship. Since God had not gotten his attention the first time, the Almighty sent a great storm to stir up the waters and panic the sailors. The desperate shipmates battled the fierce storm, um, fierce storm as long as they could. Although seasoned mariners, they had never experienced a, a storm like this one. They quickly realized this was no ordinary storm due to the mighty winds and the overwhelming waves. The sailors realized a divine hand was stirring up the tempest. They did not believe in the Lord, so they cried out to their gods. Ironically, they showed far more reverence to their false gods than Jonah did to the one true God. They knew this was from God. What they didn't know is who God was. They, they, they didn't serve God. But they had gods with a little g, but they did not serve the God with a capital G. So they were calling out to their false gods. And obviously it wasn't working because the Bible said that the, the winds and the waves became tempestuous. In other words, it's just saying that it increasingly got stronger and stronger and it just kept getting worse. And the winds getting stronger and stronger. And they knew now, as the, the lesson said, then these are seasoned mariners. These guys were sailors. They're used to being on the ships. They can tell which way the way, wind is blowing and they know about the seas and they can look at the clouds and see when storms are coming. Well, all of a sudden a storm hit that really wasn't supposed to be there. 
You know, in some tropical areas, you know, storms just burst out out of anywhere. But these are seasoned people on the ships. They know what they are looking for. They know when things are coming. They are alert and they are skilled in these things. So they knew that this storm was not normal. They began to cry out to their gods. So the next section says, the sea battered sailors awoke the slumbering Jonah. The shipmaster said to him, what meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. When they cast lots, they discovered their passenger was the cause of the powerful winds and pounding waves. They questioned him. They said to Jonah, tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? What is thy country? And of what people art thou? And Jonah told them he was a Hebrew prophet who had fled from the presence of the Lord. Then he suggested the unthinkable solution. He told them to throw him overboard. They hesitated to follow his advice. Instead, they rowed very hard. They rowed very hard, attempting to bring the boat back to land. Soon they discovered they could not fight against God. Exhausted, drenched, and filled with fear, they finally gave in to Jonah's odd request to, be thr to throw him off the ship. The, the seemingly rash act was rewarded with calm seas and a peaceful sky. As soon as they threw him over, the storm ceased. They had eliminated the source of the trouble. They had likely believed their troublesome passenger had met his end for inciting the wrath of the divine. God, however, had other plans for Jonah. That question says, what are some things in our lives we need to throw overboard in order to have smoother sailing? So we know that God wants us to be obedient. And guess what? In the natural, when we tell our children to do something, just say, okay, I tell one of my boys to wash the dishes. Now, when I come back home, I'm going out. And when I come back home, I want, them dish I want the dishes clean. Or I want the floor vacuumed or whatever it is. I want the trash taken out or whatever it is. But when I get back home, it better be done or there's going to be some consequences. You know, you don't want to have to keep saying the same thing over and over and over and over again. Why? Because you live under this roof. We pay bills here. You guys don't pay bills. So you owe me. I brought you in this world. You owe me. So. We get to the point to where God, look, God wants us to be obedient. When he tells us to do something, he wants it done. He doesn't want us to sit there and rationalize and talk ourselves out of it. But God wants obedient children. So the question again says, what are some things in our lives we need to throw overboard in order to have smoother sailing? So in other words, that storm came upon them because of the disobedience of Jonah. Guess what? That storm actually affected more than just the person that committed the offense. I'll say that again. The storm, because of Jonah's disobedience, the storm that God sent affected more than just Jonah. It affected everyone around him. Everyone on the ship was affected by Jonah's disobedience. So we can look at our families and we have to wonder, are things so messed up for my family because of my disobedience? So we just got to think about that because again, what are some things that we need to throw overboard? What are some things that we need to stop doing? Versus, or what are some things we need to start doing in order to have smoother sailing? 
when they threw Jonah overboard, when they got the problem, the situation, the, the, when they took it up, picked it up by the root and threw it out, things were better for them. Now, Jonah didn't fall and die. He didn't drown. God had, take, God had plans for him. As the lesson said, God had other plans for him. But the fact of the matter is we have to learn how to get those things that God is not pleased with out of our lives so that we can experience the peace of God. Sometimes the turmoil that we are going through is because we have taken in and we are accepting things that God is not pleased with. We are doing things that God is not pleased with. So we have to look into our lives and say, you know what? I'm tired of this. Maybe I can't sleep at night because I'm not doing what I know I'm supposed to be doing. I know I'm supposed to be more faithful to God. I know I'm supposed to be doing this. Maybe this is what's got me tossing and turning all night long. We have to turn, we have to think about our own situations. What is it that's troubling you and you can't figure out what it is that's troubling you? Sometimes we have situations that go on in our mind and we don't know where they come from. Could it be the Lord trying to get our attention? Could it be a storm sent by God to get us back on the right track? What things do we need to throw overboard? That's for all of us. It says God will deal with our disobedience. Jonah's story reveals God will not simply ignore our disobedience. We may head in the opposite direction of the plan of God. We may seek refuge and try to hide from our creator, but the Lord will undoubtedly deal with us. The, prof, the process may prove painful, but it is for our benefit and for the benefit of others. Throughout scripture, we see God dealing with disobedience. Failure to obey led to the Lord, led the Lord to kick Adam and Eve out of Eden. Disobedience cost the adulterous and murderous David a child, and it even nearly cost him his throne. Like the sailors who appealed to their gods and offered a sacrifice to the Lord after throwing Jonah overboard, many believe sacrifice can serve as a substitute for disobedience. But they would do well to remember Samuel's words. He said to Saul, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Our sacrifices mean nothing to God unless we are obedient. 1 Samuel 15 and 22 says, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken better than the fat of rams. The, the, to hearken to God means more to God than what you give him. He wants us to listen to him. He wants us to follow direction. If we do not follow direction, it doesn't matter how much we offer him. Because we're being disobedient. It doesn't matter if we're some, you know, some may feel like, you know, I'm going to give big offerings and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make sure my offering, you know, offering and tithe are not the same thing. So your tithe is your 10% of your gross, your income, your increase. That's your tithe. Your offering is, it's based on how thankful you are on the inside to God, your offering to God, your thankfulness. God, I am so thankful. And it's based off of a percentage of whatever you can afford, whatever, however thankful your heart is. If your heart is only thankful and you have $100 in the bank and your heart is only thankful enough to give $2, then that's how thankful you are. But if your heart, you can be, but some people may feel like, you know what? I'm going to give great big offerings. I'm going to give this to God because I'm, I'm doing my thing out here. I'm going to continue to live in sin. I'm going to continue to practice sin, but I'm going to give God. I'm just going to go overboard. I'm going to give God so much. He's going to be so proud of me. Uh, I, I, almost to say he's not going to look at what I do. He's going to accept what I give him. I'll read the scripture again. 1 Samuel 15 and 22 says, 
Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken, to listen to him, to obey him than the fat of rams. So in other words, the best part of your giving, the first fruit of your giving. First of all, God wants obedience. Whatever it is, he says he wants obedience. Number one, we got to think about the fact that obedience shows that we trust him. If we are not obedient, then we're saying, I don't trust you. I'm, I'm going to do what I want to do. I, I need to do this my way because I, I, my way is better than your way. I, Lord, I don't trust that your way is the best way to do this. I think for me, my way is better. Well, then is he our God? He's, he's not our God if we can't completely trust him. We can't say, oh, I'm going to pick him up and I'm going to put him down. God wants us to completely trust him and he wants our obedience. It says, disobedient Jonah not only discovered that the winds and the sea obeyed the Lord, but the wayward prophet also discovered a great fish was more loyal to God than he was. The master of all creation could count on an animal even when he could not count on his chosen prophet. This account of an obedient animal and a disobedient prophet brings the story of Balaam and his donkey to mind. Because the prophet Balaam could not see the danger before him, the Lord had to give the donkey the ability to save him. In the case of Jonah, God sent a great fish to deliver him from the raging sea. The great fish swallowed Jonah and the rebellious prophet spent three days and three nights contemplating his actions and repenting. The question says, if you were given three days and three nights to contemplate your walk with God, what areas would you improve? What areas would you view as strengths? So if God shut us away, shut us down and all we had time all we could do is all we were doing was just spending time with God just consecrating and giving ourselves to him three days and three nights what areas when we're just looking at our life looking at our walk what areas would we say need improvement Jonah's prayer it says Perhaps the darkness of the fish's belly and the digestive juices softened up Jonah's hard heart. The prophet recognized the greatness of the Lord and began praying. He said, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came in unto me, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Jonah wanted to forget about the Lord, but now that he needed him, he chose to remember. He also learned an important lesson about mercy. Because he had deceived himself, he had forsaken his own mercy. So it said, when Jonah needed God, he knew how to cry out. But it said, at first, when the Lord gave Jonah a job to do, he gave, put him on a mission. I want you to go over there and preach to them. Jonah, like the lesson says, it says, Jonah wanted to forget about the Lord. He wanted to run. He wanted to get out of there. I'm like, no, I don't want to preach to them. I'm leaving. Instead of going in the direction where God told him, he went in the opposite direction. He was out of there. Mm -mm, I'm going over this way. I'm not even going nowhere near there. So, but it says now that he's in this fish's belly, now the very God that he was trying to forget now that's the one he's calling on. When we get in the struggle, we ignore God. We may sometimes want to serve him. We may not, you know, but truly when we get in the struggle, that's what we call on God. But thanks be to God that, you know, when he hears that we really mean it. Now, if we, God knows our motives and the Lord knows that if our motives aren't right, hey, He's going to make the decisions to do what he's going to do. He's going to answer what prayer he wants to answer. And he's going to not answer a prayer that he chooses not to answer. 
again, he knows our motives and we can't play him like a marionette or we can't play him like a puppet. You know, we up there working the strings and the little legs kicking and everything. We can't work God like that. The enemy works us like that, but we can't work God like that. We must always hold on to the belief God will be merciful to us. When we have disobeyed the Lord, we may feel as far away from God as though we were in the belly of a great fish stuck in the depths of the ocean. Nevertheless, God is with us. He still hears our prayers. At that moment, when we think we have gone too far for the Lord to hear us, God will still be attentive to our prayers. Like Jonah, we may not deserve God's mercy, but thankfully God is gracious. So it's time for repentance. You know, it's time to surrender to God and say, Lord, I'm sorry for my ways. Lord, I do not want to continue in this direction. Lord, I'm going to get myself together. And even though it may have seemed like the Lord allowed us to get so low and to get so hurt and the storm has been so rough on us and we've been beaten and battered by the storm and we're sitting there wondering, Lord, why have you allowed this to happen to me? When we begin to cry out and look at ourselves and look at our walk and say, Lord, I'm ready to change. I'm ready to walk the way you want me to walk. I'm ready to go in the direction in which you want me to go in. Lord, I'm ready to turn it around. I'm ready to to move and I want to do something different. I want to do it your way, Lord, not my way. I'm ready to be obedient. When we start to turn like that, God hears those prayers. He hears those prayers. He hears those prayers of a pure with a pure heart, a pure motives, pure motives like, Lord, I mean this thing. I'm tired. I'm tired of hurting you and I'm tired of this whole situation. What I'm doing, I'm hurting myself. I'm tired of hurting myself. I'm, start, I'm tired of running into a brick wall and just banging my head up into a brick wall where I'm trying to do it myself. I'm trying to do it myself. I don't want to trust God. I'm trying to do it myself. It's not working. I'm failing everywhere I turn. This is falling apart. That is falling apart. Why? Because I've been running from the Lord. I have been running. I have been neglecting God. I have put other priorities over my Savior. I have put work over my Savior. I have put my bank account over my Savior. I have put family, children, spouses, whatever it is, we have put it over Corona, whatever it is, we have put these things over God. And these things have taken precedence over God. And God is waiting for us to come back to him. When are we going to start to step out of that and come back to it? Start trusting him. Start trusting him with your finances. You don't have to work all day and all night. If we trust God with our finances, that means if we need it, we need it. And if we want it, we got to make sure it's if that want better not be, you know, don't take from what you need to get what you want. You need to pay that electric bill. So don't take that electric bill money to go buy something over here that you want that's not important. You need gas in your car. Don't take gas money that the Lord allows us to make. We cannot take our gas money to go over here and go to Outback or go over here and go to Olive Garden with the gas money. So then what we need has been neglected and we're looking for help. We're looking for the Lord to come through and open up windows and open up doors for us when he had already done it. But we squandered it. We didn't do what we were supposed to do with what he gave us. We were being negligent with what he blessed us with. So now we've gotten to the point where some are working overtime and working extra jobs and taking them away from God, taking them out of the house of God, taking them out of the presence of God. You know, some people, some only feel the presence of God when they're with the saints. And the, the Bible tells us to neglect not to assemble yourselves together as a matter of some. We know that when we come together, that the joy of the, the joy of the Lord is our strength either way. 
but sometimes we can come together and you ever come to the to church and you feel low and you know maybe there's not a whole bunch going on but you just don't feel as excited as you know you should be in the spirit your your spirit is just not but then when you come together with the saints and the praises are going up and the worship is going up all of a sudden it just starts bouncing from breast to breast and it hits that one and you were sitting there like this earlier just like hmm and then all of a sudden the spirit begins to move and it hits you well so it's it's not really the same when you're sitting at home you know, you, you get excited. You're like, yay. But sometimes other people are in the house and they may not be watching the service with you. So you kind of feel a little weird about getting super excited and getting into it the way you normally would because there's other people in the house. You're like, oh, okay. Or your neighbors might be, you might have thin walls and your neighbors might be on the other side of the wall and you don't want to, whoa, Jesus. You know, so you have to cramp it in and you have to confine God. Well, pastor told us a couple of weeks ago that, you know, we got enough room in here for people to spread out and the seats are spread out. Some of us need to come back to the body. We all need it, but I'm just saying some of us are falling away. So we need to the collective body, the unified body to build our strength up that we're able to fight because some of us are failing we're falling away. Our desire for God is getting lower and lower. We're getting used to not coming to church. Just think of that saying, a saint of God that's used to not coming to church, a saint of God that's now that has the full ability. I'm not talking about somebody that can't. I'm not talking about somebody that's sick and shut in or behind bars, stuff like that. Now, they saints of God too, you know, if they saved you know, they might be behind bars right now, but that doesn't mean God can't deliver and set them free while they're there. So I'm talking about a saint of God that has a full liberty of being in the body of Christ and making that decision. Oh, well, I don't feel like going to church, but I don't want to go. We have to think about that. Where are our priorities? Are we making time for God or are we just extending ourselves for ourselves? Be careful of these doors that we're opening up because if we crack open a door to show the enemy that God is not our all in all, oh, oh, that's more important than your God. Oh, that's a crack. If we show the enemy that there is a crack in the foundation, he will come down, come in and try to crumble our house. We have to, not only the enemy, but when we are not completely submitted and on track with God, our flesh, if we stay away from God too long, our flesh will begin to get strength again. Our, our flesh will start to, boy, that's a muscle right there, yo. Our flesh will start to get stronger and stronger. And that's a scary thing, y'all. We don't want our flesh to be strong. Mm-mm, because a strong flesh will not obey God. Strong flesh will do what it wants to do, and it will make all kinds of excuses. So we have to look at where we are, and we got to get back to putting God as number one in our lives, not all this other stuff. All right, so back to the lesson. Hold on, I got to find out where I am. We must hold to the belief. Mm -hmm. We're going to go to, I don't know where I am, but we're going to do uh, Jonah's deliverance. Jonah's deliverance, and that's on page 79. It says, Jonah declared he would obey the Lord. Excuse me. Jonah declared he would obey the Lord and he would offer sacrifice. He said, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. While the Lord appreciated his sacrifice of thanksgiving, he must he was most interested in Jonah paying the vow he vowed he owed to the Lord as a prophet. In spite of his dire circumstances, Jonah also recognized the one who could deliver him from his strange predicament. 
He knew salvation only comes from the Lord. Jonah's prayer of repentance led to his salvation. God delivered him from the belly of the great fish. The harrowing journey would soon come to an end as the aquatic beast swam up from the far reaches of the sea and spat out Jonah on the ground. Even though Jonah, excuse me, even though Jonah had utterly failed, the Lord showed mercy to him and gave him a second chance. Thankfully, God is a God of second chances. The story of Jonah also illustrates he is a God of second callings. The Lord called Jonah for a second time to fulfill his mission and preach a message of repentance to the Assyrians. This time, Jonah answered the call and began preaching to the Ninevites. Although he might have feared these enemies from such a great city, he was more afraid of the Lord because he had already experienced his wrath. What more does God have to do? We know the God that we serve. We know that he controls everything. Why would we not obey him? We know that he inspired his word of God. And it said, you spared a rod, you spoiled a child. He also said, and the word of, he also breathed into the people of God and they penned in the word of God. He said, uh, you reap what you sow. Who wants to take those kind of chances? If I close my ears to God and I don't want to hear what God got to say, hmm, when I need him, he, uh, he might close his ears to me and not hear what I got to say. And the worst thing we can do is offend God in such a way that he closes his ears when we need him the most. Now, he loves us. But there can come a time where we ignore him so much. The Bible said God he'll laugh at us in our calamity because we don't listen to him. We ignore him. We don't want him. We some and, and then when we when we have a need, all of a sudden we cry it out then. Well, God is wondering, where were you when I was calling you? He'll t talk to me like, Barbara, now look, you know I told you, don't come to me asking me for this until you fulfill what I told you to do. I told you to do that and you know it was me that said it. Don't come asking for nothing else until you do what you're supposed to do. Now, I've had times where the Lord has said, look, get yourself together. Get yourself together. You know, just because, you know, everybody is not in worship when they cry. Sometimes the Lord is spanking people and it hurts. That guilt and that pain, that hurts. Like, Lord, I am so sorry that I let you down. Lord, Lord, I am so sorry. And it hurts. But God wants us to be repentant. God wants us to say, I'm not going to let that happen anymore. Lord, I'm not going to ignore you anymore. I, when you speak, I'm going to listen. When you tell me to go, I'm going to go. When you tell where you lead me, I will follow. Lord, I'm going to do whatever you ask me to do. Now, I understand that's a big pill to swallow because sometimes God does ask the hard thing. But guess what? If he asked it of us, he knows that we have the ability to do it. Why? Because it's not in our own ability. It's in his. He's going to supply everything we need in order to fulfill what he's told us to do. He's going to supply it. All right. It says, Jonah experience, Jonah's experience reveals the great mercy God has, God has bestowed upon us. We must not take the mercy of the Lord for granted. Instead, we must embrace the call to repentance so we can receive compassion instead of of judgment. We want compassion instead of judgment. So it's time to turn it around before it gets too late. We don't want to receive the judgment of God. We don't want God to say, you know what? I'm a, look, because you were disobedient, here come the storm. Here come the rain. Here come the lack. Here come the famine. Here come the pestilence. Here come all this stuff because you did. You're going to lose these battles. These battles are coming and I'm going to make sure you lose these battles because you were disobedient. God is serious. God is serious, saints. 
All right, it says, let's see. The book of Lamentations declares the Lord's mercies are new every morning and his faithfulness is great. Jonah had spent three days in the belly of the fish, living what must have seemed like an endless night. However, a new morning of redemption arose when the Lord delivered him from the belly of the great fish. It was time to move. This time, Jonah wasted no time. He went to the capital city of the Assyrians and preached to the wicked Ninevites. Jonah may have expected and even hoped that they would not listen to his preaching. He wanted nothing to do with these terrible enemies. Despite Jonah's personal feelings, God moved upon the city in a mighty way. Great revival broke out. The people responded to the word of the Lord from the least to the greatest. Even though Jonah did not want God to forgive the people, the king of Jonah held out hope that the Lord would show his great mercy. He proclaimed a fast for all under his charge, even extending to the animals in the city. He said, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? So they, the city repented. The king commanded everyone to fast. The city repented. And it's also something that um, the lesson didn't say, but it was talking, um, the word of God tells us that when Jonah, when the fish spat Jonah, spit Jonah out on the dry ground after his repentance and the Lord sent him release, well, it said that the journey to the capital city, the journey was a three days journey, but the Bible says that Jonah made it there in one day. So he was moving. So we got to look, I want us to look for a second at our deliverance. When God, when God, when we have a repentant heart and God brings us out, we have to be quick to be about our father's business. Don't let anything distract you. When we get in our mind, you know how like we get into a high service and we say, Lord, I promise you I'm going to study more this week. Lord, I promise you I'm going to pray more this week. But by next Sunday, Lord, I'm look, I'm going to pray every day. You, but then when we get home, distractions come and we forget all about the vow that we made to the Lord. But we did make a vow. We said, Lord, I promise you I'm going to do better. Lord, I promise you. We're making vows to the Lord, but we got to make sure we keep our vows. We have to make sure because I'm telling you, there was no distractions with, with Jonah after he came out of the belly of that fish. It was a three days journey. Only took him one day to do it. He's like, oh, no, don't nobody talk to me. Don't nobody look at me. I got, I got to be about my father's business. I got to get there. I got to get there and I got to get there quick because already there's still, there might still be a part of me that don't want them saved, that don't want them delivered. I don't want that part to rise up and, and come back after God done shown me all that he's able to do to me if I don't be obedient. God has already done some things to us and God has shown us get back where you're supposed to be. Now, we can't lose focus. The enemy wants to lose focus. He wants to pluck up everything that God puts in us. Every piece of every word, every, every encouragement, everything that God puts in us, the enemy wants to pluck it out. He wants to pull it right up. As soon as you get home, Many, some of us, you know, we deal with memory issues. So if we don't write it down, by the time we get home, somebody said, what was the preaching about? Oh, pastor preached up something. What was the topic? <coughs> what was the scripture? <coughs> we don't know. So look, you know you. If you have to write it down, write it down. I know me. Y'all see me on the side writing stuff. Why? Because I know me. And I have to do whatever it takes for me so that I can go back and look at the word. And thank the Lord, you know, we got services recorded now so we can go back and look at the service. But I know me, you know you. Don't let anything distract you from keeping your vow to the Lord. Whatever you said, Lord, I promise you I'm going to do this thing. God is holding us. He's holding us to it. Once you make a vow to the Lord, you got to keep it. We need to keep it. All right. Um, even though 
It says, God forgave and showed great mercy. It says, even though the Ninevites had committed great atrocities against God's people, the Lord forgave them. The mercy of the Lord is not limited to any particular group of people. While many of God's people, like Jonah, may not want the Lord to forgive their enemies, the Lord revealed his mercy is universal. God's mercy reaches all nations. The Lord's compassion is not merely for a select few. God does not show favoritism to one group over another when it comes to when it comes to mercy. Psalm 34 and 18 declares the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save as such as be of a contrite spirit. Because the Ninevites were contrite, the Lord forgave them. God doesn't care who it is. If they break, if they if their heart opens up to him, if their heart breaks and they turn and repent and cry out to him, God is going to come and he is going to forgive. He's going to heal them. He will not turn them away. He will not despise them. So it doesn't look at us. Look at. As I said earlier, look at some of the things we have done. Look at our past lives. It says, um, even though the Ninevites had committed great atrocities against God's people, the Lord forgave them. Look at the great atrocities some of us have committed against people. Look at some of the things we have said about saints, some of the things we have said about the church, some of the things we said about God. Look at how we have lied on God. We said that God said this and God believes this and God accepts that and he doesn't. We lie to people, spreading lies about God, spreading lies about the church. I'm not saying Mount Calvary. I'm talking about spreading lies about God's church worldwide. The church isn't real. God isn't real. Heaven isn't real. All of this stuff that we have said and done, yet God forgave us. That same mercy that he's shown unto us, he wants us to extend it to others. It says Jonah became angry. Even though Jonah knew of God's great mercy, he fell into despair because he did not want to see the Lord give such a wonderful gift to his enemies. He said, I prayed, O Lord. Um, he said, I prayed, I pray thee, O Lord. Was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore, I fled before unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. He said, well, Lord, I told you you were going to do this. This is why I left it. He, in other words, th to sum it all up, this is what he said. He said, I knew you were going to forgive him. This is why I left in the first place. This is why I didn't want to come to him. I didn't want to preach in the first place because I knew you were going to do it. He said, um, and so then he said, oh. So because you done forgave him, you might as well just go ahead and kill me. You might as well just go ahead and take my life because I don't even want to be here anymore. I told, I, all, after all they done done, you done forgave them. I don't even want to be here. And we're, we, we reading this now. We're saying, what in the world was he thinking? But I'm going to keep reading before I summarize that part. He's, when the Lord did not answer his prayer and allow him to die, the hard-hearted prophet held out hope that he would see the Ninevites punished. Believing his feelings about the Ninevites were justified, he sat outside the city hoping to see God's wrath. Instead, God showed mercy. So even though he had ministered to them, even though he did what God said, he still didn't want God to forgive them. So he was thinking, hmm. At some point, God will change his mind and God is going to punish them. So it said like he sat outside the city waiting to see, uh, I don't know, fire and brimstone or whatever. He waited to see them consumed, but it didn't happen. God showed them mercy. Since Jonah had still not learned his lesson, the Lord attempted to reach him once more. He um, actually, we're going to skip over that and we're going to go to. Um, it says on page 81. We must not begrudge God for showing mercy to others. The question is significant to us today because we can all hold grudges against others. 
we can forget Jesus's command to love our enemies. Therefore, we must ponder the story of Jonah and its final question in order to avoid having a bad attitude like the cantankerous prophet. We should not have enemies. Even if we feel like we have enemies, we should hope God extends his great mercy even to those who have treated us terribly. Oftentimes, we want God to judge others. However, mercy is the true remedy. Mercy can change our enemies, transforming them into our friends. So we got to get to a point to where we just continue to pray for people. Um, the scripture says, <sighs> goodness gracious, it slipped right by me. Mm, maybe it'll come to me before the end. But we have to be careful when we're thinking that, oh, I'm better than that person. We are not better. We are not better. We, I am better than no one. Better than no one. Sometimes we get to the point to where we feel like God should honor us over them. God, but God is no respecter of persons. God loves us and he loves them. You know what? God loves sinners. He does not love sin, but he loves them. He loved us when we were sinners. He loves us now, even though we still have some sin in our lives. We're still in this flesh. We still say yes to this flesh when there are times when we should not. But yet God still loves us. He loves them. So we got to pray for mercy. That person that gets on your nerve on the job, instead of praying, Lord, get them, we pray, Lord, save them. Lord, forgive them. Lord, release them of that heaviness, that, 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 that hard heart. Lord, give them a heart of flesh instead of that heart of stone that they have. Lord, help them. Pray for your boss. Pray for their attitudes because some people, once they get a little bit of power, they take that thing to, the, it goes to their head and they start just doing crazy stuff. They go off, but we got to pray for them. Don't let hate and grudges build up on the inside of us because they will make us bitter and bitterness will cause us not to be able to love people. It will cause us to, uh, instead of loving people and expecting good of people, we'll start expecting bad. Oh, well, they ain't going to do nothing to take advantage of me. They're just trying to use me. We'll be, we'll be thinking everybody's trying to use us and take advantage of us. Why? Because of the bitterness that is brought up in us. So we have to be uh, quick to forgive, quick to let things go, quick to pray for people, quick to show people mercy. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Lord, forgive them. They don't know. Lord, they don't know that they're hurting me. And even if they do know, Lord, it's okay. I've been hurt before. It's okay. I'm going to be all right. All right. So closing this out, it says we need God's, God mercy, God's mercy at all times. We should not begrudge God's mercy to others because we also need God, God's loving kindness. In fact, we cannot live without it. Even though we try to do our best, we can find ourselves giving into sin and stumbling due to, due to the weights in our lives. God's mercy is full. Excuse me. God's mercy is our lifeline during these situations. If we want to receive mercy, we must be merciful. If we are not merciful, God will not show mercy to us. Therefore, we must not hold on to grudges like Jonah did. Instead, we must hold on to the promise of God and show mercy to all, even the worst of the worst. So it says, if we want to receive mercy, we have to show mercy. Change your mind. We have to change our minds about how we think about people. They talked about us. They did us wrong. They told lies on us. They mistreated us. But we got to say, Lord, I'm okay. Lord, forgive them. Lord, get them right. Sometimes when you see the same actions coming out of the same people over and over again, it just gets on our nerves and you're like, oh my God, Lord, get them. No, Lord, get them right. Don't just get them as far as punishing them. But Lord, I pray that they repent. I pray that they turn before it's too late. That's the heart God wants to see us have, a heart of love. He's a God of love, and yes, he's a God of wrath as well. He's a God of judgment as well. 
But some things we got to leave to God. We got to do our part. God is going to be the judge. We have to pray for people. Pray that they make it back before it's too late. Pray that they don't get lost in their own ways, in their own self. Having a heart of love for people. So that's our lesson for today. So we have, we serve a great God and he's a God of great mercy. So what we have to do, we have to be a people of great mercy. And that final sentence that I read, that's the one I want to close out with. The final sentence says, if we want to receive mercy, we must be merciful. If we are not merciful, God will not show mercy to us. So if we want to receive mercy and the forgiveness of God, then we must show people mercy and forgive people. Let it go. It doesn't mean you don't remember it anymore. I understand that God threw, you know, our sins and he took them and he, he our, our weights and he just threw them in the sea, never to be brought up again. But we're human. We remember things, but it doesn't stir up that same pain, that same anger. We have to get to a point to where we know they did it, but it's okay. Father, forgive them. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for this lesson, teaching us mercy, O oh God, teaching us, O oh God, to forgive people, O oh Lord, teaching us to be obedient, God, teaching us to move when you tell us to move, teaching us to walk in your way, O oh God to put you first, oh God. Hallelujah. Father, we love you, Lord Jesus. We're asking, Lord, that those who have to throw some things overboard, God, that we do it and do it quickly, oh God. That those that go through the struggle because of their disobedience, oh God, that when you bring us out, oh God, when you deliver us, that we run to do your will, oh God. That we keep the vows that we have made to you. Those things that we have promised you, we're going to stop doing. Those things that we have promised you, we're going to start doing. Whatever the vow we have made. Let us keep our vows to you, O oh God. Let us be obedient to your word, O oh God. Obedient to your spirit when you speak it into us, O oh God. Help us, O oh Lord. Hallelujah. To uh, my God, come to you with a broken and contrite spirit, O oh God. Brokenness. Lord, forgive me for my ways. Forgive me for my actions. Forgive me for, for my grud holding grudges against people and being mean to people. Oh my God, because of the way they have treated us, Lord. But Father, help us to pray for people. Those who um, misuse us and despitefully use us, oh God. Those who are called to be our enemies, oh God. Those who are against us, those who take advantage of us, those, oh God, hallelujah, who break our hearts and hurt us and cause us all kinds of anguish, Lord. Help us to pray for them, oh God, that you might deliver them, that you might set them free, that you might bless them, their lives, that you might bring them out, oh God. Father, we're thanking you right now, Lord, for new vision, hallelujah. We thank you, God, hallelujah, for this. We pray in Lord, that this lesson here, that it would take scales from our eyes, oh God. Those things that are once in clouded, being seen through clouded vision, oh God. That you clear out our vision, oh Lord. That we might be a holy people before you, oh God. That we might be righteous people before you, God. That we might do your will, oh God. Hallelujah. Ah, my God, my God. Hallelujah. Understanding that obedience is better than sacrifice. Yeah, my God, you desire that we be obedient above anything we can ever offer unto you, oh God. Father, we love you right now. We love you for your direction. We love you for your correction. Hallelujah. We exalt you, Jesus. And in Jesus' name we pray. Our soul says amen, amen, and amen. God bless you, saints. Amen.